Welcome back to the Crucible of Champions, and today we will be taking a deep dive into the November showcase of Dragon's Dogma 2. However, please be advised, with the Crucible being my magnum opus, we are going to be spinning out in every which way conceivable, whilst desperately trying to maintain any semblance of direction. Please be sure to like, comment and subscribe, and remember to always read between the lines. Like most of the previous showcases, we have a brilliant compilation of clips covered during the presentation, and we'll examine each of them when displayed during the showcase. Headlining the presentation is director Hideaki Itsuno and producer Yoshiaki Hirabayashi. Though it saddens me to know previous producer Hiroyuki Kobayashi is no longer involved with Dogma due to his recent departure from Capcom. But based on everything we've seen thus far and now know, we can submit that Dogma 2 is in good hands with Itsuno Sama along with the support of Hirabayashi-san and the entire Dragon's Dogma team over at Capcom. After their brief introductions, we take a look at the release date trailer. March 22nd, 2024, just in case you're unaware. We are open to a night sky, observing a banquet with Bront announcing some very interesting dialogue, closing with the step of an individual through grand doors. This time I'll be saving most of my story theories for another video I'll have out very, very soon. Be sure to subscribe so that you hear when it comes around. However, allow me this one chance to go out on a very large limb. Please give me a moment of your time and pay close attention to the scene and Bront's dialogue. At last! The bell has tolled on the age of the console. The return of the Sovereign. The introduction to the trailer is no coincidence as I believe it holds a very deep message to be interpreted, apart from its actual narrative elements in conjunction to the story of the game. Let's look at the opening of the first game, a night sky and in the trailer we are opened to a night sky too. This is the second and true attempt of Itsuno Sama and Capcom's original vision. Now let's read the dialogue. At last! The bell has tolled on the age of the console. The definitions of console are as follows. Firstly, an official appointed by a state to live in a foreign city and protect the state's citizens and interests there. And second, the two annually elected chief magistrates to rule the Republic in ancient Rome. Next, a tolling of a bell. When a bell tolls, it rings slowly and repeatedly to signify that someone has unfortunately passed. Now let's put that together. A bell tolling on the age of a console means a time period whereby a certain individual who has been protecting the citizens of the state has come to an end. And Brant's next line is... The return of the Sovereign. A sovereign is a person exercising extreme authority, such as a monarch, and that monarch has returned in the form of a sequel. Now here's that large limb completely unrelated to Dogma 2's story. The console was Capcom hosting an experiment in uncharted territory, primarily an action company developing an intense, combat-focused RPG. The Sovereign was the first Dragon's Dogma that gave us fans of action and role-playing a true representation of the blend of the two in motion. It was the Sovereign of action RPGs and it has returned, effectively ending the age of janky, cluttery, poorly executed action RPGs. Some of them were great at role-playing but still lacked as action. Dragon's Dogma 2 is here to finally, once and for all, show the world what a true and tested action RPG will look like. And that is represented by the Sovereign returning at the height of the banquet. Back to the party. As you might have guessed, this has nothing to do with the actual story, but rather my interpretation of the symbolic nature of the opening to the trailer. 
Now let's get back to the concrete. We next see a few of the previously shown cutscenes mixed with some gameplay in between. There seems to be a stark contrast between the Pawn Legion cutscenes we've seen before and now. This one looks to be more polished as the pawns are differently attired, the lighting is more effective and the Arisen is not clad in any armor. Initially, I thought this to be an effect of procedural generation, but I think we can amount this difference to being a work in progress. If not, it's probably both. Conventionally, the cutscenes are merely more refined as we approach release. After slowing the gameplay footage down, there's not really much I could add other than what's already been said thus far. Fighters are quicker, have flashier parries, and thieves are lightning fast. From what I could see, the strider slide is now on archers. We can see a familiar goblin attack to the right, that being the shoulder charge, and a mysterious glowing orb spinning around the arisen. It's probably a buff of some sorts, I've never seen anything like this previously other than some magic buffs in Outward, and that's definitely another game I plan to analyze in the future. Following that is a few shots of Batal's countryside, civilization, and Empress Nadinia at work in the mysterious flame room, with Manila observing closely. We next see the previously shown trickster. Conjuring a dragon constructed out of smoke to roar at a mid-air griffin. The character continuously spins the apparatus while the image is being summoned. I think the trickster uses illusions of previously encountered enemies as attacks. Either that, or there would be specific skills for using specific types of illusions. Then we have a warrior delivering some attacks while mounted on the head of a fire-breathing dragon. This is where I think that Monster Hunter World will have another strong footing in Dogma 2. Special attacks while mounted, instead of a couple of regular stabs and swings. We can also see some wooden spikes next to the mage on the right. We know that there are many ways to use the environment offensively, and I think these spikes are no exception. Just like the bridges, boulders, geysers, and all that good stuff. And them ears! Remember ladies and gentlemen, the elves are back. We see a female elf tending to a tiny tree growing within a barren location. I'm absolutely clueless about what this might mean. However, I'm sure the story part of my mind is conjuring up, but like I said, next time. But another word on the elves. Like the Beastron, they were included in the original version of the game, but unfortunately were cut. Their secluded forests became the Witchwood, and the Dwarven Mines became the Quarry. If the Beastron and the Elves are now official, I sincerely hope the Dwarves weren't given the cold shoulder. After Grigori devours the player's heart, we can see a splash of some more gameplay. The first shot, we see the Arisen and a Pawn taking on a towering Dark Knight. The creature is holding its pale glowing head in one hand, and a weapon in the other. My guess is that this enemy might be the updated Skeleton Lord. The area seems to resemble the graveyard where we can find the white boss in the first game. Some ruins with cages. It's very dark and representative of fighting evils at nighttime. Like I said in my analysis, Dogma at day is a goblins and bandits RPG, while Dogma at night is a skeletons and zombies RPG if that makes any sense. Light in the day, dark at night. Another detail we can observe is that when the pawn strikes the head, the blood spatter is a light grey or silver, and when the arisen strikes the body, the blood is red. This might be purely aesthetic, but it could also indicate that maybe magic or other sources of damage will be more effective at attacking the head than the rest of the body or vice versa. After that, we have a magic archer firing threefold or sixfold bolt on an enemy. Firstly, I call it threefold or sixfold bolt as it mirrors the original skill. Number one, it fires multiple bolts of ice, and number two, the bolts pierce and twirl for multiple shots. Secondly, the enemy appears to be some large weasel or bear like monster. Its tail has it resembling a giant wolverine, dark furred with some bulky muscles. Ultimately, 
I don't want to say it's a giant wolf due to the fact that it can fit half a human inside its bite, but a giant wolf isn't totally off the map either. That poor pawn is hanging on for dear life while its compatriots hurry to the rescue. Thirdly, we can see a large solitary pillar off to the right. Given the emphasis we've seen on the environment thus far, some part of me believes it can be used destructively as well. These pillars were in the first game but had no other effect besides being destroyed via combat. I'm guessing this time it can be used offensively. And finally, off to the left, it's very difficult to discern but I can see a black mass with what appears to have an animal mouth on its end. This might be a corpse of another one of the creatures the party is currently facing. Following is a shot of a gorgon working its disturbing magic. What's interesting to me is that its petrification works similar to that of a cockatrice, in that anything caught in the gaze turns to stone rather than anything that faces it directly during the attack. I'm a bit divided on this as the gazers and evil eyes required you to look in their direction to be affected by their eye magic attacks but we'll just have to see. If petrification means death and it's that fast, the Gorgon will probably have a considerable wind up time window before executing this insta kill. If not, we might be able to break out like Kratos, be freed by allies or directly block the gaze entirely. We then get another splash of clips but this time it's of the story. It's all very significant but let's focus on the gameplay for now. The shot of the Minotaur showcases the easy kill skill. Take a close look. We see the thief arisen dealing some quick dagger strikes and just when the Minotaur's attack lands, the arisen flashes and quickly responds with a jump and a helm breaker. See what I did there? More story shots and Maelstrom being casted on a Cyclops. From what I can point out, very briefly we can see the top of the hill behind the Cyclops and walls of the surrounding ruins. These are most likely locations we can use to gain high footing for a jumping grab. I have some evidence for this but we'll get into it a bit later. Once again, I don't know what the hell that thing is. But if we look closely, we can see a key around the creature's neck. This may just be purely aesthetic, but if it's anything gameplay or story related, we just might need to get this key off the monster. In the original Dragon's Dogma, the player needed to collect items known as Dragon Crests. The items would act as keys for the door to the Dragon's Castle on an offshore island. One of them was probably guarded by a powerful monster and that particular scrapped mechanic may have inspired this creature guarding a key. That is, if this is a key we need to obtain. Next up is a quick shot of a mystic spear hand battling some goblin type enemies. They are currently being electrocuted and are unable to move as a result. This might be the revised version of the Thundershock status, the secondary effect of lightning damage. The effect looks to be prolonged during the shock as opposed to the simple stun we are accustomed to. But upon closer examination, we can see a delayed double attacking slightly offset to the left. This is most likely a spell of the Mystic Spear Hand, similar to Zero's Hyper Combo in Marvel vs Capcom. A delayed apparition dishing out extra attacks and ultimately damage. And the speed of the spin, my goodness. And some more story shots with a towering figure rising out of the ocean. Colossus of Rhodes anyone? capped off with a shot of the throne that the supposed sovereign was seated upon. This is the same throne we've seen on the website artwork a couple of months ago, though I never realized what it was until a commenter pointed that one out. Thank you my friend. The trailer ends with some dialogue with what I can only assume to be the dragon forged. His secluded cave is now decorated with various monster skulls, signifying his previous victories in battle. And can we just take a moment to appreciate the detail of the helmet's visor slots. We can clearly see the insides instead of the lazy shadow texture we are so accustomed to. After the trailer concludes, Hirabayashi-sama opens us to the new monsters section being showcased. The one named Talos. Talos emerges from the ocean and is approaching the coast of Amand. 
I know this to be the case as we can see the Blue Moon Tower on the coast. The Arisen is then seen using the Ballista to attack its protruding weak points. And if you're an avid Monster Hunter fan, I seriously doubt you're going to disagree with me on this next point. Take a close look please. I cannot but fear it will bring ruin wherever it treads. Now, take a look at this. See any similarities? The misty, ruinous areas, the high vantage points for firing, the co-op assault, in many cases it's online lao all over again. Now that I'm done sifting through my fake childhood memories, let's get back to the concrete. The Talos fight looks to be much like lao, a progressive boss fight where the ultimate goal is to stop it instead of outright kill it. We can see Ballista dotted over the canyon walls and on the bridge. If you can get to it in time, you'll have a direct frontal shot across the bridge before it gets destroyed. I also love the obvious personality differences we can observe between the pawns. The first female sounds absolutely terrified. What could possibly impel a being of such size to motion? But in spite of that fear, you'll still have them performing those insane combat feats. The second female sounds more cautious of the destruction the beast is bringing. I cannot but fear it will bring ruin wherever it treads. And the first male sounds extremely determined to stop the Telos. We shall halt it together. With all the wacky and insane happenings that can occur in a Dragon's Dogma game, we can be assured we'll have tons of dialogue to wade through over many hours of gameplay. The rest of the boss fight showcases the grab mechanic and using the flying creatures to get a better landing spot. Another amazing detail I observed is this harpy swoop. Its angular motion is a nice touch to the realism of the attack. And just take a look at the complex hills we can examine in the area. So many ups and downs. The bridge above the Talos' frame its arm slamming into the mountain, the harpy strategically flying in certain locations, all of this I can submit are creative methods to reach vantage points for fighting the Talos. And the grab, like the open-ended combat chains, is vastly overhauled and complex. We can clearly see the character hold its footing on a flat surface and adjust it accordingly on the protruding ones. And the spear throw sort of reminds me of the cockatrice attack. We can assume that most of the in-game damage to the environment will be restored over time, but I'm not too sure about the spear throw. I know the concept of the game style was still in its infancy, but if we allowed the cockatrice to damage the city's supply or kill the soldiers, Aldous's dialogue will slightly alter and the quest rewards will decrease. This is most likely a similar concept in theory as the quest rewards will alter depending on how much damage the Talos has caused during its migration or attack. Next up we have an overview of the story. This section mostly highlights the important characters the Arisen will cross paths with, but to save myself from having hour long theories about each and every one of them, we'll highlight the most interesting but quick takeaways. Hirabayashi-sama's statement affirms what I theorized before. 
The sequel story mirrors the first game but takes place in a parallel world. The sequel cannot go beyond the Seneschal based on the fact that the world is a loop. Each beast, each blade of grass is born to die and be reborn again in endless rhythm. And we can see that taking place right now. Vermand is literally a mirror of Granzas. This is confirmed with the Blue Moon Tower and Ocean being on the opposite side. Vermand's politics remain the same in that the Slayers of the Dragon rule as kings. But we all know that no king has ever slayed a dragon. However, this time the false king has pawns at his side which I still believe are being controlled by the amulet he is wearing. And I was right in assuming that there is a false arisen at play all those months back, only my speculation that we are not the arisen was erroneous. The nation of Batal has an opposite view of the arisen and pawns, and worship what we now know to be the lambent flame, with Empress Nadinia at the forefront. Man, it's really, really hard staying away from these story theories I have boiling in my mind, but like I said, we'll go over them next time. Next up are quests, and this particular outing is highlighting the befriending of an elf. The dialogue is quite interesting as the elf is asking the Arisen to attend his archery ceremony, as the Arisen has gifted him a bow. I would then assume that this takes place after some prior quests of initial discovery, and there is a strong emphasis on befriending in this particular instance. If you remember that we spoke about the secluded elves that were cut, this would fall hand in hand with the secluded elven sanctuary being journeyed to. If we closely examine the environment, we are running through an extremely dense forest covered by the shades of massive trees, hence secluded. And we all know this is a work in progress, but look very closely at the ground behind the elf. See it? Have another. But Alakalwa shall know their ma- Very slightly, we can see the ground move. Usually this can be ultimately amounted to it still needing some refinement. But if not, I hope not, we are standing on a giant Groot that protects the elven forest. If it is, my feeble mind is going to explode in anticipation. Or another explanation could be that the camera is simply not stable for some reason. And ultimately, the ground does have some formation resembling the inside corner of a fist. But take this all in with a grain of salt. I'm sure you already have been. <laughs> Just take a look at the sanctuary. We are literally in the woods of Lothlorien. Lord of the Rings inspired the first game and what was scrapped, and ultimately Dogma 2 is experiencing that same inspiration. After we are wised up on the quest, we can see the party taking on some wolves. This is the reason I don't believe the giant creatures we examined earlier were wolves. The size difference is too great. Nonetheless, we are dealing with the rebel while the elf races to his sister's rescue. Once again, we see the slide and now a charged shot. If this is an archer and not a ranger, I would guess that the charged shot takes the place of the heavy attack and the rapid arrow fire is set on the light attack. If not, the charged shot is simply full bend from the first game. We can also see a goblin attacking alongside the wolves. Maybe enemy mobs will sometimes be working together. And if this is the case, we might see them also fighting each other. We see some more footage of the quest, the Arisen saving the elf woman and a showcase of the elven sanctuary, Lothlorien, sorry I mean the sacred arbor. I like the new interface of pawn descriptions, it's more structured and easier to read than the ridiculously small menus. And if language interpretation is a special aspect, I can't wait for the others we are still yet to discover. If elves have a language, I'm very certain that Beastrin will, and of course the dwarves when they're found eventually. I only hope that we can learn the rest of the languages or our own pawn can stack them, as I would imagine it would be absolutely painful to have to simply understand certain NPCs we have to change pawns, out of a giant map which is two times larger than Granza's, half for Vermand and the rest for Batal. The weight remains intact and we can see a notification off to the right. It's most likely an indicator as to when a pawn crafts an item. 
I believe that to be the case in this scenario as a logistician manages the life cycle of a product. We can see the Arisen grab an apple while being very heavy. And after that we get a notification, we then see another item and the weight slightly decreases. It decreases as the items are now used up and the new item weighs less. This would then mean that logistician pawns can craft items in the Arisen's inventory. After all, I could be mistaken, but I'm very certain that I'm on the right track. And about what I said earlier about high footing, we can clearly see complex climbing taking place. I don't believe we're going to be able to climb vertical surfaces like mountain goats, but there is definitely a ton of climbable surfaces given what we can see. If we can climb up this terrain, I'm very certain we can scale the hill behind the cyclops. Following up is the character creator, but I don't have much to say. In terms of making humanoid characters, I would say the gaming industry has reached some insane peaks and Dogma 2 is certainly on the same strides. What I do have to say on it specifically is that I don't think we'll be able to play as elves. Pointy ears should be racially exclusive to elves. If we can have those on humans and beastern, then the race option as an elf would then be obsolete. The same would go for making players as short as dwarves if they are going to show up, which I hope that they do. We then have a look at the trickster. And if the geysers are not used for jumps or explosions, I'm sure the trickster has a use for them. As Ituno san describes them making use of the smoke their senses produce. If the vents are for that purpose, I would assume it wouldn't be anything overbearing. Because if it was, that would be permanently limiting trickster players when there's no geysers close by. We can make smoke clones, have enemies attack each other and also floor a damn griffin with a dragon clone. With that in mind, I wonder if we could conjure Sun Wukong's cloud somersault to gain high footing. Translation, Goku Sun's flying nimbus. Yes, we are speaking in English, so I'm saying the last name second. Don't butcher me in the comments please. And once again, we observe goblin-like enemies fighting alongside the rock-type Saurians. And once again, we can see two mobs fighting alongside each other, goblin-like enemies and rock-type Saurians. If using the trickster's tricks has them fight each other, they were definitely working together before that. Thereafter, we have the product information with some familiar sounding sounds. Next, we have a few additional details to share. Where is it from, I wonder? I'm very curious as to what these items all do, but I can speculate that the Hoppy Snare smoke beacons are most likely an item to draw the creatures in for a grab. I don't know what else I think it could mean. There isn't more analyzing here, so let's move on to the conclusion. Finally, Itsuno san and Hirabayashi sama close with showing us with what we now know is the Dula Han and a drake, alongside the warrior and sorcerer vocations. If we observe closely, we can see some of the spikes now lay destroyed. By this, we can certainly confirm that the spike posts are used offensively as a part of the environment. Secondly, after the warrior grabs, we can see some standard climbing and he begins running while mounted on the drake's back. I'll dub this sectional climbing. Special maneuvers and actions depending on the circumstances and creature. We saw sectional climbing before when the thief ran across the cyclops' back. And we can use more skills when mounted apart from dire gouge and scarlet kisses. And with the Dullahan encounter, I can see this game is going to be absolutely brutal. We all know that Dogma 1's difficulty was absolutely abysmal. And by seeing the Dulaen first floor the party, then mercilessly drains the health of the Arisen, this enemy is not to be trifled with. But off in the distance, our sorcerer begins encounting the mighty meteor swarm of Bolide. Just as the Dulaen begins its own incantation, which looks to be a swarm of necromancy, the Arisen rushes to the side of the pawn for a powerful spell sink in order to rain down bricks of fire atop the head, sorry atop the neck of the Dullahan. And we hear once again an epic 
super force of an amazing climatic struggle ending theme with a bang. Now, as much as I wanted to end this on a high note, I sincerely hope we don't get those frame rate drops in game. I don't care about your nostalgia. Please, Capcom. My PC is aged and I'm getting this on PS5. I've already had my fall of 30 frames on PS3 for a few years, with Dogma's frame rate dropping to about 2 and 5 per second when I had a full party of sorcerers. For the price in my country's money, I need 60 frames with no drops. Please. Thank you so much for all your generous support for stopping by. I'll have the webpage breakdown and story theory out very soon. And if you enjoyed this ride, why not go a step further and subscribe to the channel, drop us a like, comment your thoughts below. And if you are an even super above you currently being a superstar, share this video with your friends and especially fellow players of Dragon's Dogma. We've been sitting tight for more than 10 years for a sequel and finally it's here. Remember to always read between the lines. I am Rumble and until we meet again.